Okay, so now that we've gone through talking about shapes of molecules, here's where it actually becomes important, aside from the various structural things that involve reactivity, um, is polarity of molecules. So in the previous chapter, we learned about how to determine whether a bond was, pol was polar and which direction the polarity went. So when we said that we had a bond with HF, hydrogen is more electronegative. So we draw the arrow towards the, uh, excuse me, fluorine is more electronegative. So we draw the arrow towards the fluorine. Okay, so now we're going to extend that to uh, molecules. Okay, and when we determine the polarity of a molecule, we're talking about the sum of the dipole vectors. Okay, and, we're, and when I'm talking about the vectors, I'm talking about these arrows. Okay, those are dipole vectors. All right, so we're going to use, make use of the electronegativity chart and determine whether a bond is, a individual bond is polar or not. And then we're going to take into account the shape of the molecule, the molecular shape. Okay, so let's take a look at um, some examples here. And the first one we want to talk about is um, the nitrite ion. And the strict Lewis structure for the nitrite ion will look something like this. Okay, when I finish my Lewis drawing, I'm going to end up with something that looks like this. And so we want to determine the geometry. Right, so it has three areas of electrons, remembering that double bonds count as one area. So our base shape is trigonal planar. With one lone pair, means that we have a bent molecule. And so if I draw this in a slightly more realistic fashion, we'll have a bent molecule. So if I draw in my vectors, so oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, I'll draw in the vectors on the bonds that looks like this. So I have a general downward trend, right? The sum of my dipole vectors is downward, right? There's nothing pulling upward to counteract that. So we say that we have a net dipole, right? And if we have a net dipole, that means we have a polar molecule. Right? And the shape is important. If I were to do the same thing with my strict Lewis drawing, I would say straight out this way and straight out this way, and my dipoles would cancel out, right? But considering the real geometry of this molecule, because it's bent, we have a downward pull towards the oxygens. So the nitrogen end of the molecule is positive. The oxygen end of the molecule is negative. So we have a polar molecule. So let's take a look at a few more examples. So carbon dioxide, right? The Lewis drawing for carbon dioxide will look like this. All right, we have two areas of electrons, so the molecular geometry is linear. All right, and the oxygens are more electronegative. All right, and because this is linear geometry, the strict Lewis drawing is actually representative. Okay, so here our, our vectors cancel out. 
right? So there is no net dipole, right? There's basically in this situation, we have a tug of war going in opposite directions with equal force. So no net dipole results in a nonpolar molecule. Right, so that shape matters. If I had a bent molecule in this situation, like with the NO2 minus, I would have a polar molecule. But because this one is linear, I end up with a nonpolar molecule. Let's take a look at my good friend, ammonia. So our strict Lewis drawing will end up looking like this. Okay, and from that Lewis drawing, I can determine that the electron geometry is tetrahedral. And my molecular geometry, which is what the molecular, what the molecule actually looks like, is trigonal pyramid. Okay, so if I draw this in a slightly more realistic orientation, right? So a wedge line is a molecule that's coming out of the page towards you, a dashed line, it's going away from you, and a solid line is in the plane of the page. Okay, so this is how chemists and other scientists use um, different line drawings to show a three-dimensional shape on a two-dimensional surface. All right, so if I draw in my um, vectors, nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, just by a bit. Okay, so they're all pointing in an upward direction towards the top of the pyramid. So the result is a net dipole, which gives us a polar molecule. All right, let's look at a slightly larger structure and see how that plays out. So IF5, right, the Lewis structure for IF5, drawn in a three-dimensional version. So I'll have a wedge and a wedge coming out of the page towards you and dashes going into the page. So what we have is a square planar, not square planar, square pyramid. Molecular geometry. All right, there are six areas of electrons around my iodine. So I have an octahedral electron geometry and with one lone pair my molecular geometry is square pyramid or square pyramidal, right? So if I draw in my vectors, right, those are a square plane. That is the base of the pyramid. So they're pulling out towards the corners with equal force. But then I also have that arrow pulling, pulling up towards the peak of the pyramid. Okay, so I have an overall net dipole going this direction. So it's a polar molecule. Right, so we really need to take into account
the arrangement of atoms, what is the molecular geometry, where are the forces going, do they cancel each other out? Okay, a common way to, to express this, so if I have methane, if I draw it in a three-dimensional orientation, Right, all of these are equal in direction. Right, everything cancels out. It's all pushing in towards the carbon. So it's nonpolar. Now let's change this up a little bit and do a similar structure, but change one of the atoms. Right, so if I have my three-dimensional drawing, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon is. And carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So I have an overall net dipole. Okay, so it's important to take into account differences in electronegativity and molecular shape, so or molecular geometry. All right, so we're going to go ahead and stop this video right here, and we'll do one more video talking about shapes and angles of larger molecules and cis versus trans in molecular orientation.